Good morning, St. James. It's wonderful to be with you as your preacher today. Father Ben left no announcements for me to make for the good of the order, but as it turns out, I was hanging around at Claire's on my way to record this sermon, and I had lunch with one of the most beloved sons of St. James, the Reverend Selden Walker, who is about to become the rector of Grace Church, Yorktown, and I have prevailed upon Selden to say a word or two of greeting. Good morning, St. James. It's so wonderful to be with all of you this morning. I just wanted to thank you for all of the love and support that you've always given me um, from the moment I was a short little acolyte walking down the center aisle all the way till now where I'm going to be the rector of Grace Church in Yorktown. Uh, your love means so much to me. I'm so thankful for you. You're in my thoughts and prayers each and every day. Um, happy Sunday. Again, thank you for all that you've done for me and my family. Good to be with you this morning. And I bet you like that better than most of the announcements. And now let us worship God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Hello, St. James. We miss you. Take care, stay healthy, and we hope to see you soon. The Lord be with you. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Now it's time for praise of the people. Dear Lord, I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, the Congress and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Keith, for Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Steve, Bonnie, Omni, Christine, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, for Ansel, for Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, also for Barbara, Anne, Marilee, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all healthcare and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. 
I ask your prayers for all who seek God, for a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. My family, my health, and my happiness. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honoured. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, our more. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed into the field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest shrub and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Again he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and has caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it be at the end of an age, the angels will come out and separate evil from the righteous and throw them to the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? He said. They answered yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The word of the Lord. Rabbi Jesus has captured my imagination this morning. He talks about a treasure that was hidden in a field and that someone was willing to sell everything to raise the funds to buy the field. I have to admit that on some level, I am a treasure hunter. I know this because I'm always slightly intrigued when I'm channel surfing on public television, probably looking for a British mystery, and suddenly there's about a 20-minute episode of Antique Roadshow, and I'm just captured. Because you see, I've had this vase in my possession ever since my grandmother's estate was settled. It's an old antique Chinese vase and my fantasy is that it's really worth about $30,000 and that there are all sorts of Chinese entrepreneurs that are ready to reacquire all the antiquities that fled towards the West and I am going to be made very wealthy. So I find the image of buried treasure, very evocative. And so I, I like the beginning metaphor. I like the image that we are all on some level looking for that treasure, looking for that special treasure that if we find it will be the key to an abundance that has so far eluded us. 
But that is sort of backdrop. I want to tell you that I am basically, half of this sermon is the simple repetition of a sermon I heard three years ago that changed my life. Now, I have been an, a practicing Christian for 70 years. I've listened to millions of sermons, preached a few, but let me tell you, it is a rare reality for me to actually remember one, particularly one that I heard three years ago. But I was in New Hampshire a couple of years ago. I, I tend to go every summer, except they closed the summer chapels because of COVID, so I'm not there this long, hot summer. I wish I were. But I was in New Hampshire. Barbara was back in Virginia. I was alone in the rectory. It was Saturday afternoon, and it was approaching 4 o'clock. And I knew that the Roman Catholic Church in Whitefield, New, New Hampshire, has their uh, weekend Sunday vigil service on Saturday at 4. Now, when I was the Bishop of Kentucky and very active in the life of the Episcopal Church in the House of Bishops, I was the, the uh, chairman of ecumenical work for the Episcopal Church. I had also been appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury to an international Anglican Roman Catholic uh, forum of bishops called EARCOM, the International Anglican Roman Catholic Commission on Unity and Mission. That's a mouthful. And so I have spent a good bit of my life as a bishop doing ecumenical work between the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican churches. I'm interested in the Roman Church. I care about it. I care about its mission and ministry. But I hadn't been to a liturgy in a Roman Catholic Church for a long time. So to make a long story short, I ended up at the 4 o'clock Mass several summers ago at St. Matthew's Catholic Church. I was in the liturgy. The Eucharist began and proceeded as it did, in, as it does in Roman Catholic churches, very much like our church. It came time for the homily, and this priest arrested me from the first words out of his mouth because he talked about antique roadshow. And he said, come on and admit it. Come on, let's just admit it. On some level, we're all treasure hunters. And as I told you, he had me then. And he went through the sermon, and it was excellent. He was very easy to listen to. He was a great teacher. He gave the sort of context of the, of the parable and how the parables each had usually one point. The point of the parable of the treasure hidden in the field is that the searcher gave everything unreservedly for the sake of that treasure. And then I want to tell you about the moment that arrested me. He changed the tone of his voice. He began to speak in a very personal and a very relational way. And he said to the congregation before him, I want your permission to plant just one thought in your mind. As you come forward for the Holy Communion, as you come forward to receive the very person of Jesus in the Eucharist, I want one thought and one thought only to be in your mind. As you walk forward to receive, I want you to know that you are the treasure that the Lord Jesus has given everything for. As you come forward, know that you are approaching that treasure hunter that gave everything for you. That you are that treasure. And suddenly, tears were streaming out of my eyes and falling down my face. I have been approaching the Eucharist for all of my conscious life since I was confirmed at the age of 10. But at that moment, the impact of being that treasured enveloped me. And because I am a rule follower and know that under the circumstances of that Saturday afternoon, 
I could not make provision for allowing myself to break the Roman Catholic rules and to receive the Eucharist. But I longed to be in that line, just as many of us are longing for the Eucharist we haven't had since March. I longed to be in that line, and the next day, when it was my trusted privilege to, provide, to preside at the Eucharist at the little summer chapel I've been taking care of for 40 years, as I was celebrating the Eucharist, I was just absolutely stunned by the reality that I and everybody in church with me celebrating that Eucharist the following Sunday morning were the treasure that was worth so great a price. So, unfortunately, circumstantially, we are not able to celebrate the Eucharist today. But we've all been in that line, and we've all remember those times when we have been so nurtured by the presence of Jesus in the sacrament of his body and blood. We know what that feels like, and because we know, we long to receive the Eucharist again. So I want to plant a thought in your, in your mind because I think perhaps there will be ways that we can soon have the Eucharist in very careful ways. I want you to think that you are that treasure that Jesus has given everything for. But that priest's name was Matthew Mason. But I want to add a Ted Gulick thought to Matthew Mason's eloquent sermon. And that is, that the next time we go to the Eucharist, we walk forward thinking that we are the treasure worth such sublime price. But after we receive the Eucharist, as we are walking away from the table, I want to plant another thought in your psyche. I want you to realize that as we leave that Eucharist, having been so treasured, then we become treasure hunters in Jesus' name for his sake and for his glory. I want us to realize that every encounter we have with every, in every encounter we have with every human being, we are meeting and encountering a person that is so treasured by God that God did not spare his only son, his dearest treasure, his treasured and beloved son. Every time we meet another human being, I hope bells will ring in our consciousness that we are meeting and encountering the treasured, the very treasured of God. We are living in unsettling and troubling and stretchy and demanding times. And there, there is no doubting that. But I want to add something to this season, and that is that perhaps we need to think, rethink this stretchy season because the more I read and the more I pray, the more I think that this season of COVID-19 is a profound call to a desperate reorientation. I chose, I choose these words carefully, a desperate reorientation. I was just reading some research this week about evidences of climate change, and I was reading an article that said, given this reality of impending dramatic ch climate change that is in fact escalating more than was predicted, that there will be mass migrations of human beings desperately searching for livelihood, for food, for water, for shelter, for a way of life. There will be great transitions in the human family as a result of what is yet to come. That is a profoundly scary thought. And how will we handle that future? Well, perhaps COVID-19 is the school that as we are living in learning to live with less and learning to assess our own uh, 
realities and learning to guard each other by our careful careful decisions maybe this is just a prelude for how we're going to have to live in the world in the future how we're going to have to realize that sometimes my own personal liberties my own personal proclivities will have to surrender to the good of the other the future is in God's hands and God is a treasure hunter I think we will live and survive the future to the extent that we know ourselves to be the treasure that was worth everything and equally importantly we will know how to treasure every human being as the beloved of God who is worth our concern our love and our sacrifice there was a man who heard there was a treasure in a field and he sold everything he sold everything the treasure consumed him may the treasured of God consume us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen
Go forth to your homes in God's peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord. In your lives, be kindly affectioned one towards another. Remember the poor, the sick, the friendless, the suffering, those in need and those in sorrow, and the grace, mercy, and blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go on the treasure hunt. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.